Although the neuromuscular junction is a very appropriate model to describe how chemical synapses function, it still lacks a lot of features that synapses in the central nervous system have, which we are now ready to consider. The first main difference is the quantity of innervation that the postsynaptic cell receives. At the neuromuscular junction, the muscle fiber is usually innervated by one motor neuron, whereas in the central nervous system, neurons can receive up to a thousand connections. Secondly, the signal transmission in the neuromuscular junction is mediated by a system of one neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, binding to one postsynaptic receptor, the ionotropic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. As a result of this simplicity, muscle fibers only receive excitatory inputs. On the other hand, chemical transmission in the central nervous system can be mediated by many different neurotransmitters, which bind on many different receptors that can be either ionotropic or metabotropic. Due to this diversity, postsynaptic neurons can receive excitatory or inhibitory inputs. Another very important distinction between the two systems is that action potentials in the neuromuscular junction will usually produce an action potential in the muscle fiber. As we've discussed, the threshold for action potential in the muscle fiber is rather low, so the effects of acetylcholine are very strong. In the central nervous system, the presynaptic inputs are generally weak, such that it takes many excitatory inputs to generate an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. Also, given the addition of inhibitory inputs on the postsynaptic cell, it adds an additional layer of integration that we will have to consider. In all, there are five main differences between the two systems that we shall consider in this section. Luckily for us, the work we've made with the neuromuscular junction, such as the vesicle cycle, or our understanding of ionotropic channels, is still very valuable and will apply to the central nervous system. With this being said, I want to begin our conversation on neurons in the central nervous system by first describing what metabotropic receptors are and what purposes they serve. In the brief introduction about chemical synapses, I've introduced metabotropic receptors as receptors that have indirect effects on the cell through biochemical signaling pathways and that their effects can last considerably longer relative to ionotropic receptors. In terms of what we will cover in this video, we will go over two major families of metabotropic receptors the G-protein coupled receptors, and the receptor tyrosine kinase. By examining these two classes of metabotropic receptors, we will be able to understand how the amplification and the modulation occurs in neurons. Let's first cover the G-protein coupled receptors, or simply GPCRs. So, all GPCRs consist of seven transmembrane alpha helical regions, and as every receptor does, it contains a binding site for a specific ligand, which in our case will be a specific neurotransmitter. As their name entails, these metabotropic receptors are coupled to a G protein. G proteins can come in many different forms and subunits, but for this video, we will consider the most relevant type that applies to neurons, which is the heterotrimeric G protein. Here, heterotrimeric means that the G protein is made out of three different subunits, one alpha, one beta, and one gamma. The alpha subunit is loosely associated with the membrane, whereas the beta and gamma subunits form a strong bound complex that is more tightly associated with the membrane. At rest, the alpha subunit is bound to a GDP molecule, and the G protein is said to be in the inactive state. Now, to activate the G protein complex, it requires that the ligand on the given GPCR binds to the binding site of the receptor. When that happens, it changes the conformation of the receptor such that the G protein can now bind to the receptor. This binding promotes the exchange of GDP for GTP. The binding of GTP then causes the alpha subunit to dissociate from the beta gamma complex. Under this state, the G protein is now considered to be in the active state. Active alpha and beta gamma subunits can now interact with a variety of effector proteins that either directly influence the behavior of the cell or produce diffusible second messengers that in turn trigger further biochemical cascades. The interaction between the alpha G protein and the effector will also accelerate the rate of GTP hydrolysis, such that the G protein can be reformed. To every GPCR pathway, there are always the same four components. The ligand that activates the receptor, the G protein, the receptor itself, and then the effector, which can actually include many effectors, not just one. Now, as long as the ligand is bound to the receptor, the receptor will remain constitutively active, 
and continue to switch the G protein in the active state. As a result, one receptor can activate many G proteins and produce an amplified signal. It is only when the ligand unbinds that the signal can be turned off. One last thing that I want to emphasize before we examine actual examples of GPCRs is that for each component, ligand, receptor, G protein, and effector, there are hundreds of different types that all have different functions in the cell and lead to different biochemical cascades. Hence, the way I will go about to differentiate all the various mechanisms is by considering what type of G protein interacts with the receptor we are covering. In this video, we will consider three different G protein pathways, GS, GI, and GQ. As I discuss these mechanisms, I will introduce the concept of second messengers and phosphorylation. The first G protein pathway that we will consider is the GS pathway. Here again, we have our metabotropic G protein coupled receptor and our G protein. This pathway begins just as we have previously described. The ligand of the GPCR binds and induces a conformational change in the receptor. The activated receptor can now exchange the GDP from the alpha subunit to a GTP molecule, which now activates the G protein and causes the dissociation of the alpha subunit. The activated alpha S subunit can now interact with its effector protein. The main effector of the alpha S subunit is the integral membrane protein adenyl cyclase, which becomes stimulated when the alpha S subunit binds to it. This stimulation of adenyl cyclase leads it to catalyze the conversion of ATP to CAMP. CAMP here is what we refer to as a second messenger. Now, obviously, by saying second messenger, it entails that there is a first messenger, and indeed there is. The first messenger here is the ligand that binds to the receptor, or in other words, the extracellular signaling molecule. Hence, we can define second messengers as intracellular signaling molecules. Second messenger is a fairly common term used in biology, and it covers a vast array of molecules like CAMP in this case, and later we will see other examples like calcium, IP3, and diacylglycerol. Due to the diversity of molecules and their downstream substrates, they have a diverse number of functions ranging from cell proliferation, differentiation, migration, survival, apoptosis, phosphorylation, depolarization, and so on. Anyhow, in this case here, CAMP here acts as a second messenger and one of its major targets is the CAMP-dependent protein kinase, also known as protein kinase A, or simply PKA. PKA is a dimer of two regulatory and two catalytic subunits. The catalytic subunits are the units of the kinase that phosphorylate other substrates. At rest, when there is no CAMP, the regulatory subunits bind and inhibit the catalytic subunits. As you can see, the regulatory subunits each have two binding sites for CAMP, and upon binding of four CAMP, the inhibition is relieved, which frees the catalytic subunits. The free catalytic subunits are now able to phosphorylate substrates at hydroxyl groups of their specific serine and threonine residues. The most common substrates of the catalytic subunits for PKA in neurons include voltage and ligand-gated ion channels, proteins on synaptic vesicles, certain enzymes that are involved in transmitter biosynthesis, and proteins that regulate gene transcription. The phosphorylation by PKA is terminated by a category of enzymes named phosphatases, which cleave the phosphoryl group off of phosphorylated proteins. Now, as a consequence of binding to adenyl cyclase, the rate of GTP hydrolysis in the alpha S subunit is accelerated to make GDP. This inactivates alpha S and dissociates it from adenyl cyclase. The free alpha S can reassociate with the beta gamma complex. Now, remember that as long as the ligand is bound to the GPCR, the receptor can exchange GDPs for GTPs. As such, the receptor can activate many alpha S subunits that can in turn stimulate many adenyl cyclases. Now, many active adenyl cyclases also contribute to the amplification of the signal, as while they are active, they catalyze the conversion of multiple CAMPs. Multiple CAMPs can then affect multiple PKAs and generate high amounts of phosphorylation because here again, the catalytic subunits can phosphorylate many compounds while they are active. In the GS example, 
the even steps 2, 4, and 6 correspond to amplification steps as shown by the yellow circle. Remember that the main feature GPCRs provide is the amplification of the signal and it is very well illustrated here. Back to the schematic, here is a condensed view of what the GS pathway provides, which essentially summarizes what we have just discussed. As a side note, I want to mention that the S in the Alpha S subunit is conveniently chosen to be S because the subunit stimulates adenylyl cyclase. This pathway is in direct opposition with the Alpha I pathway, which as you can see stands for inhibitory. As you can see, the Alpha I pathway is essentially the same in its shape, but the result from Alpha I binding to adenylyl cyclase is inhibition. As a result, the levels of CAMP active PKA and overall phosphorylation are decreased. Now that we have covered the GS and GI pathways, let's consider the GQ pathway. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.